Hey, so uh, in this video, I'm going to be doing part one of my master's thesis defense talk, which I'm just going to break it into several videos to make it more digestible. Uh, even though I like to put timestamps, sometimes, uh, you know, if you see a video that's an hour long, it's uh, harder to click on it than a 10 or 20 minute video. Uh, of course, this isn't my actual master's thesis uh, defense. I did that about a month ago, so I'm just going to be going through the slides and more or less recreating the talk. So it is going to be pretty dense. Uh, it's not the lightest, most expository version of it, uh, but I hope you'll enjoy anyways. Uh, and I should mention, uh, there might be some, some big crazy words in the motivation uh, section and you might think, whoa, I'm not even going to get past the first slide. Uh, if the first couple slides don't make sense to you, don't worry, uh, there are more comprehensible uh, things to come. Okay, so uh, this is my uh, master's uh, thesis defense talk, which I originally gave on July uh, 28th, uh, which is called Unitary Schwartz Forms and the Ve Representation. Uh, so first, I'm just going to introduce uh, some of the, the key players in this bit of terminology. Uh, so V throughout is going to be a complex vector space of dimension P plus Q. Uh, and it's got a Hermitian form of signature PQ. So what that means is we've got an inner product, um, except uh, now you can have non-zero vectors uh, having inner product zero with, its, uh, with itself. And uh, the, the PQ refers to the fact that we can always find a basis so that uh, P of those vectors have a positive inner product with themselves and Q of them have a negative uh, inner product with themselves. Uh, in particular, we can normalize this to, to plus one, minus one for each of them. Uh, then G uh, is going to be the Lie group, U, P, Q. Uh, and this is the isometry group of the vector space with respect to this inner product. So uh, basically what that means, it's, it's the uh, collection of invertible linear transformations that preserve uh, the inner product. Uh, now, in the theory of Lie groups in general, uh, the notion of a maximal compact subgroup is uh, pretty important. A lot of information uh, is, is contained in the maximal compact subgroup of a Lie group. And in this case, uh, it just so happens that uh, K is isomorphic to uh, UP cross UQ, where this is just the classical unitary groups. Uh, now, we're also going to uh, to differentiate these these cases when we're choosing possibly different integers uh, p and q or some integer r. I'm going to define uh, g prime and k prime correspondingly, and the reason for this is that there's two things going on um, in this work. There's geometry and there's representation theory, and the geometry is going to be coming from taking a quotient of g by k, which gives us a complex manifold. Uh, in fact, it's what's called the Hermitian symmetric domain, which is just generally interesting objects in, in uh, geometry and uh, has applications to number theory. Um, and then the representation theory is actually going to be coming from the g prime uh, and the k prime. So that's why we're, we're differentiating between these things. Uh, it turns out, actually, this manifold D has a very convenient model. Uh, so uh, this, uh, you know, if you've seen Grassmannians or projective space uh, before, it shouldn't be shocking to you that the uh, collection uh, of, of Q-dimensional subspaces that are negative definite uh, also forms a manifold. And in fact, in this case, it's equal. Um, it's equal to D. Uh, I mean, just as, as a believability, like, you know, you, you would hope that if there's some justice in the world, right, if G is the full isometry group of this vector space, you would hope that it could act transitively on uh, subspaces of a fixed dimension. Uh, and then certainly if, you know, there's, or, um, of course here there's a, there's a, it couldn't act fully transitively because there's some sort of uh, a definiteness here involving the inner product and the inner product has to be preserved. Um, and then the very, there's a very natural way to see uh, K as, as being isomorphic to UP cross UQ. Essentially, it's this uh, certain block diagonal matrix. So all of that to say, we just have this convenient model, which will be really nice when we talk about vector bundles uh, uh, shortly. 
And we're also going to be thinking about short spaces of functions. So here VR just means we're direct summing uh, V with itself R times. And S of VR is the space of Schwartz functions on V. So uh, this can actually be defined uh, for any vector space. And it just means uh, rapidly decaying functions in some certain sense. So there's you know, a technical definition that goes in here, but the canonical example of this, uh, or a classic example of this, I should say, is uh, the, the space of Schwartz functions on the real numbers. Uh, the sort of quintessential example of a function is e to the minus uh, x squared. So not only does this function grow, uh, sorry, uh, decay faster than any polynomial, but uh, all of its derivatives decay faster than a, any polynomial. And that's, you know, the essence of these Schwartz functions. Okay, so uh, where is this all coming from? Uh, so this this stems from uh, a conjectured identity of uh, Stephen Kudla called the arithmetic Ziegel Weil formula, and uh, this relates uh, certain derivatives of of Eisenstein series. So if you've studied any modular forms before, you've probably come up against the example of these, these special functions called Eisenstein series. Uh, in this case, this is a generalization of, of the very classic setup uh, you're introduced to. Um, and so it takes these derivatives of, of the Eisenstein series and it relates them to generating series of uh, arithmetic heights of special cycles of certain varieties. Um, so that's that's a lot to take in if you haven't Heard, heard those words before, uh, you know, arithmetic heights, this is just essentially some sort of way of measuring uh, the arithmetic complexity, um, you know, so a, a, a basic example of say rational numbers, you know, you could take the, the arithmetic height to be, uh, if you take a rational number in its lowest form, you take it to be the size of the denominator, right? This somehow tells you the, the complexity of, uh, of the solution. Uh, and so special cycles, uh, these are uh, uh, sort of special sub varieties of, of these certain varieties. Um, so, so we have this analytic function, which is, which is giving us geometric uh, information. That's, that's what this formula is saying in some sense. And an important aspect of this is the construction of these special forms. So they live in this tensor space. Uh, where we're taking the tensor of the, the Schwartz functions on V and we're tensoring them with uh, the differential forms on our manifold D. Uh, in particular, the QQ refers to the fact that uh, the, uh, these are complex differential forms. So there's, there's Q holomorphic wedge components and there's Q anti-holomorphic wedge components. So uh, Garcia and uh, Sankaran, my, my uh, supervisor uh, for, for my master's, uh, Siddharth Sankaran, uh, they were able to obtain explicit results uh, confirming this formula uh, when uh, we take, for the varieties we get when we take these certain special quotients of, of the manifold D in the case when Q equals one. Uh, and their proof relies on the construction of uh, these certain forms. So now these are uh, a little bit more general. So, or they live in a, I guess, a, a bigger space. So this is a Schwartz functions uh, on V direct summed with itself R times uh, sitting in the, the space or tensored with the space of differential forms. Um, and it, it turns out that uh, this sort of recovers the classical uh, thing. So if you take the degree uh, 2q component of phi, uh, then you recover the classical Kudla-Milson form. And the way in which these forms are, are constructed is they use uh, Quillen's theory of superconnections. So we're going to be saying what that means uh, in a moment. Um, and uh, an essential step in their proof is, is what they do is they take um, this special representation of the group URR um, called the V representation. So it acts on this, this uh, tensor product space. And uh, okay, whenever you have a, a Lie algebra or a Lie group representation, there's some sense in which you can differentiate that and obtain a representation of its corresponding uh, Lie algebra on the same space. And so 
what we actually do is we look at a certain subalgebra of the Lie algebra we get when we do that. And we look at this, this uh, special form or uh, so you'll notice I've, I've made a, a, there's a slight difference in notation. There's a new sub R there. So this just refers to a certain piece of this form new. Um, and so it gets acted on by this differentiated V representation and uh, a key step in the proof of Garcia and Sankran is showing that this is a highest weight vector. Um, so that's something we're gonna discuss uh, in a moment as well. Okay, so uh, what are the, the goals then? Uh, what did I do in all of this? Uh, well, as I just mentioned, you know, this representation uh, theoretic proof is an essential step in the Q equals one case showing this vector is a highest weight uh, vector. So if we want to prove this uh, in any of the cases when Q is greater than or equal to two, well then, you know, perhaps we should start by showing that this new sub R is in fact the highest weight vector. Um, and it turns out, actually, we don't need this uh, full form. So like I mentioned, the, uh, the that form phi in a specific degree just recovers the classic uh, Kudla-Milson form. So it turns out it actually suffices uh, to just prove this is the case for a, a certain degree component of this form, nu sub r. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, the the there's an action of g on this manifold right i mean this manifold is just g uh modded modded out by the maximal compact k and so there's actually a transitive action of g on this on this manifold uh and so we can push we can push uh points around anywhere because it's transitive um, and we'll see later on there's actually a very nice formula for the behavior of this form under this transitive action and so in fact and this is a, a key thing that actually makes uh, some of the computations later on feasible um we can just evaluate this form in the specific degree at a particular point and then we are able to understand its behavior across the rest of the manifold um, so the, the case when uh, PQ equals two, one, so this is the next easiest case, right? So we don't know the case when Q equals two. Uh, so the very easiest case is when P is equal to one, Q is equal to two. Uh, this is intractable by hand, uh, it turns out. So even the next easiest case to check, it's not like we can do a back of the envelope calculation and go, oh yeah, I think, you know, this is, this is true. Let's, let's, let's try and prove this. Um, so we actually need computer assistance. And so a lot of the course of my master's degree, I actually spent um, writing code in SAGE in order to, to confirm this theorem and, and to you know, even gather evidence that, yeah, this is something we should be trying uh, to prove. Okay, uh, and so here's the, the, the main results that I did manage to uh, show from my thesis. So um, I use a combination of both. Um, so the coding I originally used to test this conjecture became essential for the proof um, in establishing base cases because I use an inductive argument to get a couple infinite families. Uh, and then the, the finite cases are taken care of uh, by the, the actual computations. So the theorem I was able to prove is that we take this form uh, in this very specific degree. Um, we can prove it's a highest weight vector for the V representation. And you'll see, I, I said something of weight. Okay, so it has some particular weights. Again, we'll, we'll come to what this means exactly. Um, but so I, I prove that this vector is a highest weight vector under the V representation for the certain Lie subalgebra uh, for PQR in the following cases. Uh, well, first, actually, this is the, the classic case. Uh, well, this is the case due to uh, my my supervisor and, and collaborator uh, when Q is equal to one, right? And this looks like we have some restriction on R, but in fact, this is just, this is all the values of R that this result even makes sense for. Um, so so this is, this is everything, right? Uh, so the first new thing I was able to do is the case when Q is equal to two, I was able to show this for any P. Um, and now you may say, oh, well, it looks like here R is restricted a little bit. And it turns out again, actually, this is just all the values of R for which uh, this question even makes sense. So I get this infinite family uh, in the case when Q is equal to two. Uh, great. 
Um, unfortunately, because of uh, certain computation, uh, computational limitations of, uh, uh, you know, this, this code blows up pretty quickly, um, I was only able to show these, these uh, other uh, remaining cases uh, purely, purely by computation. So, uh, yeah, you can you can read for yourself these sort of very particular cases, and and the rest of these are just all done uh, by by computer. So I think I'm going to leave it there for now for the the first video, the the introduction. So I've laid the groundwork. I've told you some of the the main actors that are that are in this thesis and what it is I'm trying to prove. Uh, of course, there's many undefined terms right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is in the next video, I'm going to start explaining, you know, what a highest weight vector means. I will talk a bit about uh, super connections, uh, the super connections of Quillen. Uh, so I hope you found this entertaining and that you'll you'll stick around for the next one. Thanks. <laughs>